Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's to Con Air Education on. Series webinar. The topic of today's discussion is three ways you can immediately improve your resin drying efficiency and save energy. My name is Chad Stover. I'm the Technical Marketing Manager at Con Air, and I will be your host. This afternoon, we have AJ Zambonini presenting. It is my pleasure to introduce AJ to you. AJ is the Drying Product Manager for Con Air. He started at Con Air in the PET Packaging Group and then advanced to the role of regional manager where he managed a group of sales representatives. Now as drying product manager, he is responsible for the drying product line and product innovations. AJ graduated from Penn State University in 2010 with a degree in mechanical engineering technology and a minor in technical sales. Prior to coming to Con Air, AJ was a former Con Air customer where he was responsible for plant and capital improvement projects. His on the job knowledge of systems processing along with his excellent education, have served as huge assets in the understanding pain points and assisting customers solve problems. Recently, AJ has focused on several key product improvements and developments that make equipment more easy to use and technologically advanced. Feel free to ask any questions during the time of the presentation. Simply use the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen to type in your question. We will attempt to answer as many questions as possible following the presentation. And at the very end of today's webinar, we will be announcing the winner of that Yeti Conair Swag Cooler giveaway. It now gives me great pleasure to turn the program over to AJ. Cool. All right, Chad. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Is that right, Chad? We're good? We're good. Cool. Um, so yeah, we, whew, technical difficulties. About two minutes ago, my whole uh, presentation crashed. So we got it back up. I think we're okay. Um, I just want to start with saying these things are a little bit difficult to put together. Um, you know, I see the list of people who have signed up and we have people who are, you know, basically drying experts in their own right and are just looking for a little bit more information or maybe some tips and tricks. They do it every day. Some customers who dabble in drying and they want to know a little bit more about the process. And then other people who um, really haven't had to dry before and they're really looking to just learn more about what drying is and how it works. So it's difficult to thread that needle when you put these presentations together. Um, so when you signed up, we had you ask some questions and the questions were awesome. They were great questions. So if I didn't answer your question here in this webinar itself, um, we're going to try to address some of those ones that you guys had before the webinar. Um, and then of course, if you have more as I'm doing this webinar, I, I think there is a place in the chat where you can submit questions as well. Um, so keep that in mind. I'd be happy to answer them. I'll stay as long as chat will let me. So three ways you can immediately improve your drying efficiency and save energy. So first, I like to start with a slide. If you've been on a webinar with me before, this is this is uh, information you've seen in the past. But I went to school at Penn State. I got a degree in mechanical engineering technology and a minor in technical sales. Um, I started here at Conair as our rigid packaging PET guy. So I travel all over um, North America and I talk to people making anything from you know butter tubs to, in a lot of cases, PET water bottles, which is how I got into the drying world. PET is a hygroscopic material. Um, that can be a little finicky and really needs to be dry. Uh, from there, I became a regional sales manager here. So uh, I may even know some of you from, from my travels. I covered Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Indiana. So, you know, big plastics portion of the nation. And now I am the drying product manager, which means I'm in charge of new products, product sustainment, application, um, and how we actually move our drying products forward. And of course, what we're doing today some training. <laughs> Lastly, I always put this last because I think it's probably the most important. Um, I was a customer, so I was a plant engineer. I worked at a facility and I was responsible for making sure all the auxiliary equipment ran, um, process improvement projects. If there was an issue, let's say a blender was alarming, it's my job to figure out why and get to the root cause of that. Eventually, I became a guy who purchased capital equipment like maybe many of you do. Um, so I had to weigh the pros and the cons of different types and figure out what actually mattered to us. So I think that gave me a lot of insight as to you know, how you guys might feel um, when you're asked to, to look at new equipment. So first off, before we get into you know, how to make your process better, why are we drying to begin with? Um, there's three main reasons. Um, the first reason is gonna be better clarity and clear parts. So right here you can see, these are obviously safety glasses. You wanna be able to see out of them. Another example might be headlights on your car. If materials are improperly dried, you might see some cloudy or haziness in those products. They won't be clear. Um, 
that's indicative typically of uh, poor drying and that's a reason why we need to make sure we dry our polymers. Another one could be cosmetic. So we use the, the phrase splay. You could have some surface finish discoloration. Maybe you have pock marks or no fill um, parts in, your, in your, uh, your molded products. That could be due to moisture. So we want better cosmetic and surface finishes. And the last one, maybe we can't even see, but it's better strength properties. So moisture acts on the polymer chain on, on kind of that molecular level. It's almost like a little polymer scalpel. Your polymer chains are a certain length. That's how you buy that material. And if you leave the moisture in there, they start to break those polymer chains down. And the shorter the chain is, the weaker it's going to be. So it's very important to dry them. That's why something like this water bottle is very thin. It's basically a plastic bag that stands up on its own. I can drop it out of the trunk of my car and it doesn't absolutely explode. That's because we've properly dried it and we've got good, strong material. So how do we dry? Well, it all comes down to the four fundamentals. Um, these jokes don't get any better, so bear with me. Um, those are temperature, time, airflow, and dew point. And it occurred to me this morning that we talk about these systems and, and we may have people on the line who've never actually seen a drying system. So I wanna put this, you know, a reference in your mind as to what that actually means. This is a quote unquote bigger system. It could be all the way up to the roof of your building, 30 feet tall. Um, but we can also shrink it down to where it fits on my tabletop or my desk right next to me. The same things apply, it's just shrunk down and smaller. So those four things of airflow and dew point are gonna be created here at our dryer. Then maybe we have some type of heat source. Maybe it's in the dryer, maybe it's remote from the dryer, um, maybe it's gas, maybe it's electric, but we have something that actually heats that air up. And then we have time, and time is gonna be dictated by the volume of our hopper. Um, this is a mass flow hopper, which means material goes first in and first out. There's no augers, there's no mechanical devices in here that makes material flow. It's because of the design or the geometry of that hopper that it's mass flow. It's you know the specific L over D dimensions. It's the cone angle. All of these things make sure that material flows through that hopper like a plug. Um, what I mean by that is if we fill that hopper up and we put little pucks of colored material at the top, by the time that material falls out the bottom, we should see it four, six, seven hours after um, we put it in there, depending on what we size this dryer to. Um, and if it's a good mass flow hopper, it'll be fairly consistent in how long that material spends in there. So when I first started here, someone said material has to dry for a certain amount of time. I thought we did batches four hours here, then another hopper for four hours, then another hopper for four hours. And while batch drying is a thing, most systems like this are continuous. We continue to put cold, wet material on the top, and we continue to pull hot, dry material out of the bottom. And this is a continuous process that happens in a single hopper. So a little bit more about those four things, time. This is the amount of time that material is gonna spend in that hopper. Um, you might hear it called residence time. Um, that's what we use as the terminology in the drying world. The bigger the hopper in general, the more time that material is gonna spend in the hopper itself. Temperature is gonna be the temperature of the air. Um, this temperature is dictated by the type of material that we're drying. What temperature does that material dry at? So the temperature and the time are gonna be something you can find on your material data sheet. So this comes from the material supplier. Maybe it's a spec sheet, maybe it's a processing guide. In general, certain materials dry at certain temperatures and times. PET, 330 to 350 for six hours. Um, polycarbonate, uh, maybe it's 250 for three to four hours. Um, but specifically for your particular grade in your material, I check with the material supplier. They're gonna give you a processing guide and it's gonna give you those reference numbers. Airflow is the means of transporting energy to that pellet. So keep in mind, this isn't like an oven where we put a cake in and that heat radiates to the pellet. We're heating up the air and that hot air is being passed over the pellet. Um, if you think about it, what we're really doing is we created a material heat exchanger. We've got a cold material load of pellets coming down the hopper towards the bottom, and we've got hot dry air going up towards the top. It's a counterflow heat exchanger. So the amount of airflow that we have is very important because we need to make sure we're matching our energy in to that heat exchanger to our energy out of that heat exchanger. 
The other thing that airflow does is it serves as a, as a call it process fluid to carry that heat into the pellet and carry the moisture away and back to the dryer. The last thing we see is dew point, and this one probably gets the top billing. Um, I think the reason is, is because we don't really understand what it is. Um, dew point is just the dryness of the air. And the problem is you kind of need a meter to measure it, whereas time, temperature, and airflow, we can kind of sense with our own, our own six senses. Dew point is a little bit more difficult. So dew point does two things for you. Um, the first thing I think is very important, and I think we forget about this sometimes, it gives you consistency. So if I didn't have a constant dew point dryer, in the summer, my dryer is going to operate differently than in the winter because it's more humid outside. Or if my dryer is next to a dock door and someone opens that door for a shift and closes that door for a shift, the drying process is going to change. And those changing process parameters are never a good thing because um, it's hard to get consistency. So by feeding a consistent dew point to the process, we end up with a consistent dryness out the other side of the process. We're giving, we're taking that variability away. The other thing dew point does, a low dew point in, in particular, um, it creates a gradient. It's wet inside the pellet and it's dry in the airflow. So that moisture wants to go from areas of wet to dry. It's very philosophical, but everything wants balance. If we have very salty water and very fresh water, eventually that salt will migrate to the fresh water and create balance. If we have a hot spot and a cold room, eventually that heat will even out between those two rooms. Same thing is happening here. Um, we're creating a vapor pressure differential, a diffusion gradient, but ultimately what we're doing is we're creating a difference. And that moisture wants to reach balance, so it's gonna get sucked out of that pellet into that dry air and carried back to the dryer. This is how your drying process works, but sometimes it doesn't work. What I can tell you is if you wanna avoid looking like this guy and you need to troubleshoot your dryer, it's gonna be one of these four things. It's gonna be temperature, time, airflow, or dew point. That's all we control in the dryer. Now, if you have process issues, it's probably gonna come down to one of those. Now, there is a fifth thing. And the reason I don't include this fifth thing is because we as Conair or any dryer manufacturer doesn't control this thing. It's the initial moisture of the product. How wet is that material before you put it into the drying hopper? And this was really cool to see because in our pre-webinar survey, a dozen people asked about this, the, the effect of initial moisture on the drying process. So that's awesome. I don't usually get to talk about that and we will talk about that today. So what are some of the common drying problems? Why did that guy look like that? Here's one, over drying, right? So if I go from left to right, I have nylon material. Nylon can be a little bit tricky to dry because it can get very wet. So that initial moisture can be very high. Um, and it's also very polar, which means it doesn't like to get rid of its moisture very easily. And it also dries at a lower temperature. So I can't put a ton of energy into it to kind of coax that moisture out either. So in this trial, on the left, we have material that was dried at the right temperature, about 180 degrees for about six to eight hours. I, I don't remember the exact number. Material looks fine, no issues. The next jar is material that was dried for, I think, 20 hours. Um, and that was dried at the right temperature. And what you'll notice is even after being in there for that exorbitant amount of time, it really didn't discolor. A little bit of change, but ultimately, right temperature, it still looks okay. The next jar, our third jar in, is material that was dried at 195 F. So only 15 degrees higher than the correct temperature and only for six to eight hours. And you can see already it's starting to, to look a little bit brown and damaged. And lastly, we have 195 degree material for 20 hours and we totally toasted it. So obviously it looks bad um, cosmetically, but mechanically we may have also damaged that material by thermally degrading it um, or oxidizing it in a lot of cases as well. So um, that's why it's important to dry at the right temperatures and the right time so you don't damage that material. And this is an example of what it could look like. Another issue is the opposite problem, which is under drying. So these are big uh, preforms. So for a water cooler, let's say. So these bottles start out as little test tubes like that, and then they get blown into big jugs and filled up with water. So this was actually under dried for some reason. That could be maybe drying at the wrong temperature. Maybe it was a poor dew point. 
in a lot of cases, it comes down to time. Maybe we didn't have enough time in the hopper. Um, but ultimately, this is a problem we see regularly with drying is we get this cloudiness in our clear parts and we know, or at least we, we our first inclination is that we have a drying problem. So when we dry these resins, our goal is to do it effectively and efficiently. So if we have problems, let's get to the bottom of them sooner. Um, ideally, let's try to avoid them altogether. And during the process, how can we be the most efficient? First one, no brainer, it's gonna sound pretty generic, but maintain your systems. The better you maintain those systems, um, the longer they're gonna last and the less maintenance you're gonna need overall. Um, we'll go into detail on that. The next one is manage your moisture. This is gonna, Harken back to that uh, initial moisture point that you guys had asked about in the pre-webinar survey. And the last one is let's utilize technology. Things are not getting more difficult or more complex for no reason. Um, there's a lot of thought and time that Conair is putting into a lot of their new controls to make them very easy to use. And make sure you guys want to utilize some of these features. It's harder to find people. It's harder to onboard people. It's harder to train people. So let the equipment do a lot of these decision-making things in the background. Let them protect your material. Let them decide what's an efficient process. Um, and if you utilize these things, you're not gonna mess around with your dryers. And that's the ultimate goal. As nice as all these things are, you really wanna set it and forget it. You wanna turn your dryer on and you wanna walk away and you really don't wanna have to walk back to it until you have to make a change. So that's the goal. Utilize the technology that's built into it. And we'll talk about some of those things. So first off, this is gonna sound like a no brainer, but let's keep our filters clean. The first tip I'll say is when you do clean these filters, make sure you shut the dryer off when you do that. Um, when I say shut off, I mean, make sure it's stopped and the blowers aren't running. This filter is a barrier between the dirty side or the dusty side of your process and the clean side of your process. And it's also a closed loop, meaning one side of the blower is connected to the system and the other side of the blower is connected to the system. So if you remove this filter, you remove that barrier between the clean side and the dirty side. And what did you just do? You sucked that dust back through the system. So that's gonna damage your desiccant, whether it be a desiccant wheel or desiccant beads, it could end up in the heaters, it could coat sensors, um, make the readings go off. And ultimately it might get trapped in a place where you really can't clean it. So it's very important to make sure you're cleaning your filters regularly and you're doing it the proper way or else you're, you might be causing more damage than had you not changed them to begin with. Why is it important to clean these filters? We talked about airflow. We need a certain amount of energy in to counter the material out. Well, if we have blinded over filters, we're gonna choke off that airflow, and now that energy balance doesn't work anymore. So we have a blower that's spinning, it's using energy, but because of the back pressure from all this dust, and because there's not a lot of open area in our filter, we're choking off what that blower can supply, and now our drying system doesn't work, and we end up with those cloudy preforms that you saw earlier, or um, a cloudy uh, headlight lens, or uh, pock marks on our, on our pieces or parts that we produced. The next one is clean your after coolers and volatile traps. So people forget about these things. Um, oh boy. And when I say volatile traps, this is what I mean. Sometimes plasticizers can come out of your material. Additives, if it's post-consumer, it could be things that used to be in that product at one point in time. And this is not water, this is actually oils. These are things that we condensed out of the airstream um, and had settled back out of our volatile trap. So if we don't capture these things in those types of filters, it's gonna end up back in the dryer somewhere, coating heaters, coating hoses, but ultimately it's gonna be degrading our desiccant. It's gonna coat and cover that desiccant and it's gonna take the place of spots where we wanna to use to actually absorb and soak up that moisture. So keep that in mind. Um, we wanna keep these things clean because as you can see, this volatile trap can also get blinded over and impede that air, uh, that airflow through the dryer. In general, after coolers are located on the back of most drying systems. And because of that, they're out of sight and out of mind. So a lot of times they don't get cleaned. People don't think that they can collect dust, but especially if you're someone who's accidentally been cleaning your dryer while the blower's running, like we talked about earlier, the next stop in the line is that after cooler. So that eventually will foul up with dust and it's gonna impede that airflow. 
The other thing it's going to do is it's going to reduce the efficiency of the after cooler. And the point of the after cooler is to cool down that air before it enters the desiccant. So now it's a double whammy where you're affecting your efficiency in your system. So when you pipe these dryers in, try to do it with hoses or quick connects, um, leave space behind the dryer so you have space to actually pull that after cooler out um, and you can actually do some maintenance on it. So don't forget about it just because it's behind the dryer, it does make a difference. Um, check your hoses, make sure they're not crimped or bent, um, make sure they're not delaminated where the inside of the hose is actually collapsed because again, those could impede airflow. But on the other side of it, make sure they're not leaking because if you have a leak, that means you're probably sucking in ambient air somewhere. And now your dryer not only has to dehumidify the plastic, it's got to dehumidify some of the ambient air. A good example there is we have a customer here in Pennsylvania who uses our smart services system. That's industry 4.0. So I can see the data from their dryer. They give me that permission. And they called one day and they said, man, we have a, a crazy trend on our dew point. It seems like it rises during the day and then when we get the third shift, it starts to drop and we hit minus 40 again. And then come first shift, it starts to rise again until we're like plus 10. And I looked at the graphs and, and it occurred to me that the other thing that does that is the environment, ambient, right? So I asked them to check their hoses for leaks. And sure enough, they had a, a gasket that had blown and they had a big leak in their piping kit. And we could see that show up as a changing dew point in the dryer. So it's important to check your hoses, make sure they're not impeding airflow and make sure you don't have any leaks. And that might be inside the dryer. So you may wanna open it up and just rattle it around and make sure your hose clamps are tight and you don't have any air leaking where it shouldn't. And lastly, change your desk skin as necessary. As you start to see your dryer work harder, regen more frequently or regen at higher temperatures, it might be indicative of a need to change the desk skin. Um, there's a couple other things to check first. Now manage moisture. This is going to come back to that question that a lot of people asked about initial moisture. 100% it's going to impact your drying uh, process. I like to look at it as a race. So if we have a starting line to run that race, we know if we start here, we're going to end at a certain amount of time. However, when your initial moisture continues to rise, what you're doing is you're moving that starting line back. And the further you move that starting line back, you're ensuring it's going to take you longer to reach the finish line, or if you only have a certain amount of time, you're not gonna reach your final goal. And in this case is your desired final moisture content. How much moisture your initial moisture can be is gonna depend on the type of material. So a polycarbonate might saturate at 2,500 parts per million or 0.25%, but a nylon could saturate at eight or 9% moisture. That's very wet. It's very difficult to dry that back down. How it actually is going to gain that initial moisture is going to depend on that material type, the ambient conditions, and the amount of time that it's exposed. So if I have polycarbonate out in New York State during the middle of winter when it's very dry for 15 minutes, it's not going to gain much moisture. But if I have nylon in the middle of summer in Louisiana out for two weeks, it's going to be very wet and it's going to be very difficult to redry. So it's all gonna depend on what your process and your environment look like. So a couple tips here, don't leave material sitting out. So a lot of times very hygroscopic materials, especially nylons might come in 50 pound bags. So instead of opening 10 bags because you know that's gonna get you through the shift, open one or two at a time, try to keep up with it. Yes, that's more painful, but your drying process is gonna be more consistent and you're gonna ensure a good dry product. Um, if you don't use all your material. Let's say you had a Gaylord of material. Try to seal that back up as best you can and store it in a place that's not exposed to big environmental changes where you can actually gain that moisture back. Um, that's a big thing we see. People have big boxes of nylon. They open them up. They only use half that box for the run and then they store it on a shelf. Um, a month later, they go back to run that material and they have all sorts of problems and they think it's because of the dryer. More than likely what you did is you move that starting line back past where you can effectively dry that resin. So you have to be careful there. Another tip, this one's pretty basic, but dry your regrind. Um, if you grind it right up at the press and throw it back in, you're probably gonna be fine, especially depending on what type of material it is. But just because it's not virgin material doesn't mean you don't have to consider how you're going to dry this material. So keep that in mind. If it's been sitting out, sitting offline, sitting outside, you're gonna have to have a way to dry your regrind as well. Maybe that's mixing it with the virgin and drying it as a batch. Maybe it's two separate drying systems. 
but consider some way to get the moisture back out of that regime because it will also gain. And my last tip, if you think you're having a drying issue, test the final moisture. I'm assuming you have some type of lab equipment where you can do that. Um, and what that final moisture is gonna tell you is, did you reach your goal? Are you dry enough to actually mold this part? If you're not, how bad is it? But the other thing that we typically don't see people do is test your initial moisture. And if your initial moisture is way off the charts, then it's probably not the dryer that's the problem, it's the material that's the problem. We've, we've moved our starting line too far away and our current drying system can't handle that moisture load. Another thing you might see if your initial moisture is very high, and this was a question someone had asked to a certain extent, they said, even with a brand new dryer and brand new desiccant, I can't get a good dew point. There could be a couple mechanical reasons in the dryer for this. Maybe it's not operating properly, but more than likely what that usually means is we're overwhelming that desiccant. We're either running too many pounds an hour through a dryer than what it was sized for, or the moisture content that we're asking this dryer to handle is too high. And I see this a lot with nylons or bio-based resins where our initial moistures are greater than 1%. Um, it just overwhelms that desiccant or that sponge that we're using to absorb that moisture and it can't handle it. So that, that shows up in our drying system as an elevated dew point. So keep that in mind. Um, here's a great chart. Um, this is for Zytel material. It's a nylon um, PA66, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, there you go. And what they showed was moisture regain of this material. So given 23 degrees Celsius, and 75% relative humidity, that seems reasonable. That's a summer day here in North America. Um, we're gonna start at around 2000 parts per million. By the end of first shift, if we leave that material out and exposed to these conditions, we're almost at 0 0.8 or 8,000 parts per million. That's how quickly this material can gain moisture when exposed to that environment. So that's why it's very important to manage your initial moisture content because the way this material dries when you first open the box, and the way it's gonna dry eight hours later are gonna be two totally different things. The other thing I'm gonna note is just kind of a tip, don't increase the air temperature to dry faster. Um, we see this a lot, and again, I, I'll mention nylon because it typically dries at about 180 degrees. So that's a low temperature. What people tend to do then when their moisture gets really high, like what you're seeing over here on the left, is they put the pedal to the metal, they stomp on the gas, and they raise the temperature to 220, 230 degrees. And what they found was that they can drop that moisture content much faster that way. And they're probably correct. But in doing so, they're probably also damaging that material. And you're going to end up with a result that might look a lot like those four uh, mason jars that we saw earlier. So while it might work to dry the material, it's not the proper way to do it. You're better off having a good, consistent drying process. So try to manage your moisture content. Um, don't try to cheat the system. And the last one, let's say, uh, let's utilize the technology that's built into the systems we have, whether it's Conair's or someone else's dryer. A lot of these features exist today. These are standard things that didn't exist 20 years ago. Now they're just kind of uh, normal technology. Um, so when you're specking these systems out, it's important to ask for some of this stuff. Do you have a way to do dew point control? How do you protect the material from over drying? How does your dryer work? So we'll go into some of those, those points here in a minute. The first thing, is more CFM better? I hear a lot of people say they want one CFM or more. Well, that typically can come from the spec sheets. And I can tell you, because Conair works with a lot of material suppliers, it's a little bit misleading and it's a little bit outdated information. So one CFM per pound is free airflow. That means if I take a blower and I hook it up to power and I turn it on, I'm probably going to generate one CFM per pound of material process. So pound of material down our hopper, CFM up into our hopper. But in, in real life, that's not how these dryers work, right? We have a blower and it's connected to hoses. It's connected to filters. It's connected to after coolers. It has to go through a whole hopper full of pellets. It has to go through desiccant. And all of those things put back pressure on the system. And as we put back pressure on the system, our blower operates on a different point in the curve. So in reality, a lot of these dryers actually operate more between 0.5 and 0.7 CFM. So it's important when you spec your dryer, tell them the application. I want to process this many pounds an hour of material. Um, and what material? 
and let your dryer vendor help you size that system. Don't spec a certain size dryer or a certain CFM because that can be misleading. Now, why is it important not to put too much CFM through the system? Well, it can cause problems. It can fluidize the material. It can keep material from dumping. So if you've ever had issues where your material wouldn't actually discharge from the loader, it could be because you have too much pressure in the hopper due to too high a CFM. You can carry material over, which means you can blow it out of the top of the hopper. But for the sake of this discussion, energy, it's gonna cost you more energy. And here's, here's why. Um, a little bit of nerd alert here. This is the energy equation. This is a heat transfer equation. And what it really transfers to here in our sake is energy equals airflow times the specific heat of air times the temperature out, that's our drying temperature, minus the temperature in. That's the temperature into the heater. So this is the amount of energy it takes to heat that air up. Well, if we look at it this way, the specific heat of air is gonna be the same, regardless of whether I use one CFM or half a CFM. My drying temperature doesn't change. I'm still targeting 350 degrees or whatever my process requires. And for the sake of argument, let's say that our temperature into the heater is always consistent as well. So what that really means is that energy is directly proportionate to airflow. So if I double my airflow, I double my energy usage. If I triple my airflow, I triple my energy usage. So more airflow, it could actually cause you issues in the drying process, but it's actually gonna cost you money um, to heat up that extra amount of air. And it's probably gonna be wasted, sent back to the after cooler and cooled back down anyway. So don't oversize your systems. Um, and make sure when you're specking these things out, uh, give them the application um, because one dryer is not the same as another dryer and the way one company does it is not the way another company does it. The other thing is I say you use smart designs and this is a little bit unfair because of course when I say smart design I'm, I'm showing you a, a Conair dryer but of course we think that that's a good design. So on the right you see Conair's desiccant wheel dryer, on the left you see a, an example of a twin tower dryer. There's a couple of main differences here. Of course, we have a desiccant wheel. That desiccant wheel only has one moving part. It has a very open area. It only really has desiccant, so we're only heating and cooling a very low mass. Um, but also, if you notice, we have two blowers. We have a blower here to dry our plastic, and we have a blower here that regenerates the desiccant. That's what's wringing that desiccant back out and making it dry again. Over here on the left, we have desiccant beads. Those are probably gonna break down over time, but also um, they're a very high mass. There's a lot of clay binder. So you spend a lot of temperature and time heating and cooling those beads um, up and down. So that takes energy. But this is an interesting design, right? So it only has one blower, which in general seems interesting. You, you might think that's um, very efficient. What it is, is probably inexpensive. It's inexpensive to make. It might even be a little bit less expensive for you to purchase, but there's some issues with a design like this. So in this system, if I have a single blower, I create airflow, I pass it through my desiccant and I suck that moisture off of the air, no problem there. I send it through a heater, I heat it up to a certain temperature and I pass it over my material and back to the blower not a major problem there. But because we don't have a second blower, this blower needs to be oversized so that it can also provide airflow to the regeneration side of the dryer. So now we have a bigger blower instead of one very small fractional horsepower blower over here. But more importantly, what you see is that, call it 20, 25% of that air is being used to purge moisture out of the system. Well, if I'm losing 25% of the air here, I have to make up 25% of the air somewhere, and that's here. That's from a, a purposeful leak in the system that's pulling air in from the room. And we mentioned earlier, one of the main things, reason we do this is because we don't want to tie our dryer to the room. So that's what we're doing here. A good example is it's like turning on your air conditioning and opening up the window. It's not efficient for you to do at home. It's not really efficient for you to do when you're drying plastic. Over here on the left side, I'm only handling the moisture that's coming off of the plastic itself. I call it cook it off the plastic for, for lack of a better word, and I absorb it into the wheel, and then I pull it back off. In the system on the left, I have to constantly be dehumidifying a portion of the room air. So if it's summer and it's very humid, um, that could be a lot of extra regeneration, a lot of extra um, energy, 
But also one of the questions we were asked was, hey, uh, my dryer doesn't always work perfectly. Certain times of the year, it doesn't work or it works better than other times. Well, this could be why. In the summer, you're sucking in humid air um, and it's causing your dryer to be basically undersized or inefficient. So keep that in mind. Some features that work really well on a desk and wheel dryer, but I'm sure you can get on other dryers, something called dew point control. That's gonna deal with this regen side of our dryer. So instead of just letting the dryer create whatever dew point it wants, we punch in minus 40. That's the gold standard of drying. Doesn't always have to be, but people like that number. So we punch in minus 40 and the dryer will use that like cruise control to hold that dew point. So if we load in a new box of material that came from a bag that was sealed and it's already fairly dry, there's not a lot of moisture load there. So the dryer will sense that. And as our dew point starts to go lower and lower, the dryer says, well, hey, I'm working too hard. And it will pick, it will reduce that regen energy to hold a minus 40 degree dew point. No need to work any harder than that. Same thing happens if we automatically introduce material that has a wetter moisture content. So maybe it was stored out in a silo. The dryer will automatically react to that. You don't have to do anything. So as our dew point starts to increase, meaning closer to zero, the dryer will recognize that and it'll re increase its regen heat. It'll start to wring that sponge out or that deskin out harder. And its whole goal is to maintain that cruise control set point of minus 40. So as your moisture contents are changing, your dryer is constantly updating its energy usage to the most optimal level to meet the settings that you told it to. Um, instead of you going in there and trying to guess what that is, um, the dryer is doing these things automatically to save you money and make the most, you know, the easiest, most efficient process possible. Um, that can equate to almost, you know, 40% savings on the regen energy alone. And you see what that means here in a, in a generic graph is if I'm regenerating at 200 degrees, I use this much energy. If I'm regenerating at 350 degrees, I use this much energy. So the difference obviously then between 350 and 200 degrees is this. This is our savings in energy, right? And in some cases, it can be significant, hundreds or even thousands of dollars a year. Um, and all you have to do is click a button. Um, I don't see any reason not to ever use dew point control. Um, turn it on and it's just going to save you money. The next thing is temperature setback. Um, temperature setback is the way we protect our material from over drying. So let's think back to those mason jars from earlier in the presentation. Um, one of those was, was left on for 20 hours. So let's say we go to stop the machine because we have a problem with our mold. It's supposed to be a quick 20 minute fix. Someone's gonna go in there and clean out the gate and we're gonna start back up. And of course, nothing ever goes to plan. We open the mold and we open up a total can of worms and that machine's down for two shifts. Well, you have two options. Either the material sits in that drying hopper just baking at drying temperature for hours upon hours. Or if you guys are fairly savvy, you go over and you shut the dryer off. The problem with the second option is that now you have to remember to turn the dryer on and you have to turn the dryer on a few hours before you're ready for the machine to run. You don't know exactly when that's gonna be. So more than likely you're gonna forget to do it. And once you get the machine back up and running, a couple hours later, you're gonna be back down because you're dealing with wet material. In the first option, that material is probably just going to overdry because it's just sitting there simmering in that drying hopper for hour upon hour. What temperature setback does is it automatically senses these start and stop conditions or these over drying conditions and it'll turn your drying temperature back to a safer standby temperature. So if we reduce the drying temperature, it's like taking our foot off the gas pedal for the drying process. So if I'm drying at 250 degrees, maybe I back my drying temperature down to 170. And then when my machine starts back up, the dryer will automatically sense that and it'll put the gas back down. That way you don't have to remember to go turn that dryer back. So if you use temperature setback, you're going to save energy while your machine is down and you're going to protect that material from over drying. Again, this is technology that's built into your dryer. You guys probably fight these issues all the time. Um, use that technology that's there. And if you know, you're a Conair customer, by all means, call us. Um, call your local salesperson. Call the Conair service line. We'll walk you through how to use that for sure. We have a lot of literature, videos, um, things that can help uh, explain these a little bit better. Um, 
So with that, um, I'm a fast talker, but in general, I think we, we hit the highlights. Um, Chad, um, are there any questions? And that's questions from before the meeting or questions that came in while we were talking? There are. So one of them, um, just starting at the top here, for ISO 7 clean rooms, do you recommend the dryer be located outside of the room? And do you have auxiliary equipment made for ISO 7? Yeah, so I'm sandbagging here a little bit. So I already put a little uh, presentation together. Conair um, has a series of medical rated equipment. Med line equipment is what it's called. So I saw this come in earlier. So I, I put this little slide together. A um, couple things about Medline. It, it does take things into account like non-marking casters to be used inside of a clean room. Um, it's all stainless steel contact points. If it's aluminum, it's anodized aluminum. And then we can send this equipment out with certifications for your, uh, I forget what they're called, IPQs or, or whatever's required to validate or cert certify that, that medical process. Um, so we do make changes to the equipment to allow it to be used inside of clean rooms. That's perfectly fine. Now, this is totally my personal preference. I would do as much outside the clean room as you can. Um, reason being is, in general, you're going to get loose pellets. So if you're doing clean outs or changeovers in a, in a clean room, they're going to be dusty. But let's say you need to make changes. If you have to gown up every time you have to go in to check the dryer, or if you got to get parts or you need to do something, it can be kind of cumbersome. So if you leave this equipment outside the room and then pass the feed through the wall, you can kind of just operate normal outside of the clean room, do your clean outs, do the maintenance that you have to do. And you don't really have to take any extra um, precautions. So my personal thought is to do it outside. We have customers who do it both ways. Um, and like I mentioned, we do have a Medline series of equipment um, for, mo for most upstream pieces of equipment, like blending, drying, uh, water, um, conveying. And we also have a line of Medline downstream stuff. Like if you're someone who makes pipettes or, or syringes or uh, stints, those type of things um, that are medical rated um, downstream extrusion equipment for, for those type of applications. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about new innovations? What, what are the new things that people are, are seeing today that they may not have seen, you know, five years ago? Yeah, so um, this was a question that was asked a couple times um, in the pre-survey. Um, first and foremost, I think controls are a big deal. Mechanically, we can do some things, we can clean some things up, make them a little bit more ergonomic, but ultimately it's going to be in the controls technology. Um, do you want to control this stuff remotely? Do you want to view it remotely? How do you want to see and use that data? But ultimately in the controls, Conair made a big push to make them simpler. Um, simpler and more consistent, kind of like Apple iPhones, right? Um, iPhones look the same as iPads look the same as your MacBook. And if you know how to use one, you kind of know how to use them all. It's hard to find people today. We recognize that. It's hard to train these people. It's hard to keep these people. So if we can make that process simpler, I think that's only going to be helpful. Now, on top of that, specific to drying, we did launch a product called the Moisture Minder. Um, this is something we tested years ago. Um, now we, we do feel comfortable to provide it um, through some testing and some updates and some changes. But ultimately, what Moisture Minder is, is real inline moisture sensing. So I can put this under a drying hopper or on top of a machine throat, and as material passes through it, I can read a moisture content. So when do you guys check moisture contents today? Probably only if you have an issue. You probably don't regularly check them. If you do, maybe it's the first time you qualify the mold. Um, if not, maybe it's weekly. Um, we have some customers that make automotive parts. They, they say they do it daily, but even then you're only getting snapshots and you're being very reactive to the process. Um, Moisture Minder allows you to see stuff in real time, 24 seven. So the advantage is real time detection. I know every minute, every second of every day, what my moisture is and if I'm having problems or if it's changing. It's simple and reliable. There's no moving parts. Um, and ultimately it's a, a fully electronic device so it doesn't impede your system whatsoever and the last thing is it's continuous so again we're, we're seeing that information in real time in general it's actually very um very accurate um this is data from a trial we did with pet so we dried all the way down to you know 25 parts per million and even being down there we were off by 3 ppm from a carl fisher moisture analyzing test 
So it can be very accurate. We say in general, our tolerance is plus or minus 15 ppm. However, I would say don't even look at the number. I think there's enough value in looking at it from a standpoint of change. Today, you don't know anything. It's a black box. The only time you know you made bad product is when your customer calls and said you had an issue, or maybe you're fortunate enough to catch it on the line, right? Um, in this case, we can set tolerances and bands. And if we're operating here today and we come in tomorrow and it's here, we know something has changed. Or we can see that change over time and stop the process before we have an issue. Um, it can alert us if it's outside of our processing window that we said was okay. It's just a lot more data that you can use to avoid making um, problems or scrap in your, in your process. So keep that in mind. It's a pretty cool system. Um, I'm happy to uh, explain more um, individually if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Question came in about long distance material pools, how to best handle you know, conveying for long distances. Yeah, so this is a, uh, a conveying guy question, but I think I can answer it. Um, here at Conair, we have a bunch of different pumps. We have a, you know, a regenerative blower type pump. Our workhorse, or what we probably provide the most, is a positive displacement load pump. And then we have two high pressure or high vacuum pumps. One's called an HRG, and one is called an LDP. Um, and these pumps can pull down to a lot lower vacuum levels. So we can withstand a lot more back pressure on the system. This allows us to pull further distances, you know, 500, 600, 1,000 feet if we need to. So we do have the technology to do that. And I'll go one step further. Sometimes when you pull these resins that far, you generate a lot of heat due to the speed and the material bouncing on the pipes. So we can go one step further and we can provide what we call a wave system, which is we actually densify the material stream and we slow it down. So now instead of zinging through there like a shot blast cannon, um, we're just slugging that material nice and slow along the bottom of the pipe, and that's going to greatly reduce the wear on the system, and it's going to greatly reduce the heat, the angel hair, and the dust that you build up. So especially when you have these long pulls from silo to some indoor position, that wave system can be a great way to transport that material so you get it there and you don't cause any damage to it in the process. What about long distance pulls after drying? Like what what, what do you do if you've got to convey that material after you've dried it? Yeah, you no, know, great point. Um, my favorite thing, biggest bang for the buck, purge the line. Some people call them cleaning valves. Here at Conair, we call them purge valves. Um, what purge valves do is they sweep that line clean between the drying hopper and the end destination. So material either resides in that warm, dry environment at the hopper or at the machine where we're using it. And we don't want to keep too much inventory at the machine. We want you know, just a couple minutes, because again, the longer that material stays out of the drying process, type of material, ambient conditions, and exposure time are going to increase the moisture level of that dried pellet. So use a purge valve, and what that does is going to ensure that material is not sitting in that line between the drying hopper and the machine. So if it's, you know, a 200-foot distance from the drying hopper to the machine, there could be 20 pounds, 30 pounds of material sitting above your head, and that could be an hour's worth of inventory that got cold and gained moisture. So I say purge valves is the way to handle that. Great question. We're looking for different ways to dry polypropylene. Any suggestions? Yeah, I think this is one I put a slide together for too. Um, yeah, I did. So um, polypropylene is a non-hygroscopic material. It could have a hygroscopic filler like a talc or something like that, but in general, it's surface moisture. So materials do break down into two different types. One is hygroscopic, which means it will absorb that moisture content in at its, its polymer chain or molecular level. And the other is non-hygroscopic, which means it's just surface moisture. So the way I explain these is hygroscopic materials are like your t-shirt materials. Um, if you go out in the rain, it's going to soak into the t-shirt, through the t-shirt, down into your skin. It's really going to soak you wet. Non-hygroscopic materials are going to be more like raincoat materials or your poncho materials. Yeah, the outside of the coat gets wet and it beads up, but ultimately you stay dry underneath. Polypropylene, high density, polyethylene, these are those non-hygroscopic materials. So all we really need to do is whisk that surface moisture away from the pellet. What we do is we basically create a giant hair dryer. Um, here you can see in this picture, there's a blower. Um, there's a heater and there's a control. 
And then what you don't see on the other side is there's just a filter sock that comes off the other side. So instead of passing it back to a desiccant dryer, where we have a desiccant system and a regeneration system and a closed loop, this is a single pass open loop hot air dryer. What's cool about this is it typically doesn't take long to do that. One to two hours, we can dry this material. And these systems are much more cost effective because they're so much simpler. There's not a lot of pieces or parts. Set the drying temperature, turn it on. Very easy, very consistent machines um, for sure. This may be a similar question. Is there any advantage to drying TPE? Um, yeah, so actually TPE is uh, technically hygroscopic. So in theory, we should be using a desiccant dryer anyway. It's not crazy hygroscopic in most cases, and a lot of people don't dry it. They, it comes in fairly dry in the box. They're able to run it, but you can see a lot of consistency if you do dry it. That way you don't see that fluctuation um, from box to box or time of year to time of year. You could probably put it in a hot air dryer like this and get away with it, but technically it's supposed to be in a desiccant dryer. Um, the other thing you can get from heating up these materials, whether it's TPE or polypropylene, is some benefit at your machine because we're imparting a lot of energy into that pellet to heat it up. So when it goes into your feed throat, it might process a little bit smoother, a little bit easier. Your machine doesn't have to impart that through shear and heat at the barrel. So some people find they either have a more consistent process and better quality product, or they can actually speed up their process because they've added that heat in elsewhere. Now their machine just has to process it. So um, that could be another benefit of drying it, even if you don't do it today. Okay, would a question come in about drying bio-based materials and how to handle them? Yeah, big, uh, that's a big deal now. Um, you see a lot of stuff about recycling. You see a lot of stuff about sustainability. Con Air does work with material suppliers. I think I mentioned that earlier. And we are currently doing some trials for a material supplier for bio-based resins. Bio-based resins are very tricky. Um, they can process very well for you, the customer. Um, a lot of times replacing things like PET. Um, so there's definitely some advantages to them um, and probably a future for these materials too, but they're trickier, they're different. So because they're bio-based, whether it's cellulose or, or whatever their, their bio component is, they're organic and organic is living, right? Me, you, corn, um, <laughs> it all it likes to absorb moisture. So just like nylon, a lot of these bio-based materials can get very wet. So we like to process it, call it half a percent moisture, 5,000 ppm or less. Some of these bio materials can get up to one, two, three, four, five, six percent moisture. And we have to try to dry that down. That can be very, very difficult. So one, managing your initial moisture content becomes extremely important with these bio-based materials. If your initial moisture is elevated, we may have to do a two-stage system where we dry off the bulk of the material in something like this, like a hot air dryer where we knock it down to something reasonable, and then we finish the process in a desiccant dryer. That could be something we do. The other thing to consider with biomaterials is they typically have a lot of plasticizers, um, additives, or volatile um, content that can bake off during the, the drying process. So it's important that we put things in line to protect the dryer. So if you remember that video of the oil canister, that's the stuff that could end up back in your dryer if you don't add volatile traps, demisters, plasticizers, good cold water mm -hmm. coils to actually condense those volatiles back out of the airstream. And, and lastly, a lot of these biomaterials, they dry at lower temperatures. What's really cool about a wheel, that's a wheel dryer like we make, is it runs from 150 to 350 degrees or 375 degrees right out of the box. A lot of other systems actually have to add a secondary pre-cooler to do that. So if your material dries around 150, you're good to go. If it does dry less than 150, in Conair's case, you might need to add a pre-cooler. That way we can dry at 120, 130 degrees and hold that consistent drying temperature for you. So the temperature is very important, the time is very important, the initial moisture is very important, and how we actually protect it, the equipment we actually specify can be very important as well. You did a good job talking about all the questions. We had many questions specific to initial moisture. So trying to combine some of those um, we had someone say, how do you dry resin with higher than normal moisture? How do you affect, how does the moisture level affect drying time because of the initial moisture? What's the humidity problem solution even with brand new desiccant? And then one, you actually showed the example of it. We dry PA66 
in small batches and have trouble maintaining appropriate dryness. So questions all related to kind of that initial moisture content. Yeah, and I'd be willing to bet that the majority of those those questions come from people who do run a nylon product, maybe a PA66. So let me take them a, a couple at a time. So one thing to keep in mind is that sometimes you can't dry the resin as, as far down as you would like to or you think you need to. And by that, I mean, we do a lot of tests and trials here. And we have customers that say, I need this material at 600 parts per million. So we do a test and at six hours, it's at a thousand. And at eight hours, it's at a thousand fifty. And at 10 hours, it's at 980. And what happens is it just oscillates around that thousand PPM. Now we could increase the temperature and we could probably drive that material down lower. But ultimately that material is very polar. Even with a very good dew point in a lab setting, I can't suck that moisture down in some cases, even after 24 hours. So sometimes make sure you're, you're aiming for realistic targets. Um, do we know that that material can actually be processed down to 500 or 600 ppm? Sometimes there's confusion. People are used to molding polycarbonate at 250 and they think their nylon also has to be at 250. So sometimes there is just a, a practical limit to what you can dry some of these materials down to without adding some additional steps, right? The other thing is someone mentioned about their dryer not having a good dew point even with new desiccant. And I touched on this earlier. It could be because there's an issue with the dryer. Your, your regen circuit is, is plugged. You're not getting good airflow. Um, you're not getting the right heat. Um, there could be other issues there. But what it usually means to me is that your initial moisture is or your moisture load is too high for that dryer. And that could be because your initial moisture is very, very high. Or it could be because the dryer was sized for 100 pounds an hour and now you're running 200 pounds an hour through it. So you're asking it to take on more moisture than it's capable of. How do you deal with it? Um, if it gets very, very dry, low and slow, you might have to maybe pre-dry it offline to get it back down. But the best thing to do is don't let it get there to begin with. Conair has done some systems where um, we've actually blanketed surge bins or boxes of material so we can maintain a dryness before we process it. I have customers who will trans, uh, transfer their material into foil lined bags for storage and then they'll seal them. That way, if they don't use all the material, um, at least they can seal it back up and wait and it's going to be okay for the next time they use it. Um, if you get really wet, it can be very challenging to dry back down. So the best thing to do is don't let it get there. If you have to, it may just be a, a, a time thing. You may just have to um, low and slow pre dry this material down to down to a, a reasonable moisture. So thinking about the moisture minder is typically after the dryer to test the material before it goes into the molding machine. Are, are there people who are considering using something like the moisture minder before the drying process to test that initial moisture level? Yeah, you can. And, and what's kind of cool is if you're, let's say you're supplying from a, a silo, um, that silo might feed your entire facility. So one moisture miner under a silo or a surge bin could give you an idea for initial moisture content for your entire process. So that is a very cost effective way to do it. Same thing with, you know, we say you can put the moisture miner at the machine or under that drying hopper. If you have a central drying system like a resin works that supplies five machines, well, one moisture miner under that hopper can give you the relative moisture content going out to all five of those machines. So it doesn't have to be a big deal. You know, one or two meters could probably um, handle a, a big portion of your system. Okay. Big question here about old dryers. So old dryers that lack moisture analyzing equipment for verification, is there anything they can do to kind of improve without purchasing new? Yeah, especially if it's a Conair dryer. Um, we do have some retrofit kits available here for things like uh, dew point. So we can add a dew point sensor into your dryer so you can see that or maybe it's a an analog CFM gauge or something like that. Those things do exist. Um, we have a lot of Conair dryers out there. So, um, you know, working through these types of things is a good idea. So I'm, I'm glad you asked that. It's something I'll look more into. But we do have, you know, ways to upgrade existing things. Let's put it that way. So call, I would say call our, our parts and service line 1-800-458-1960. Um, give them your Conair serial number and, and see what's out there. How do we handle excessive dust from the resin we are drying PBT? Okay, so 
Um, excessive dust can come in a lot of different forms. It can come in the train or the boxes that you're getting in, right? Um, not much you can do about that. You could be generating the dust in your own conveying system. So it's important to make sure that that's not happening. Everything's sized okay and you're not beating up that material to begin with. Um, it's a good question because dust can be a real problem for dryers. It's just going to require you to filter the system more. So if it's a real big problem upstream, you could put something like a Pelotron de-duster or something like that, Conair can supply. Um, if that's not a route that you're able to, uh, we can put more filtration on your dryer. So uh, maybe we put a cyclone and then a dust collector in your system. So the cool thing about a cyclone is there's no filter. There's no filter to change. There's no filter to clog. There's no filter to get dirty. And the idea is that 95% of the dust that you're capturing in the drying system gets captured in that cyclone, and then you can just empty it out. There's no consumable parts there. It's easy to do. Um, then we go through a pleated dust collector filter. We try to capture a little bit more of that 5% that's left over, and then we go into our dryer. So sometimes it's just adding different levels and different types of filtration in the system. Okay. If we bought a dryer but didn't choose the volatile trap, but now we're seeing lots of volatiles, how long before it will ruin our dryer? And is it possible to add a trap after the fact? Yeah, so it is possible to add a trap after the fact. Um, sometimes they're internal traps. If it's a small dryer, pretty easy to do. Sometimes they're a bigger standalone trap, um, but absolutely you can add them. I've even added them to competitor systems in some, in some cases. Um, how long it's gonna take to, to ruin your dryer is gonna depend on how bad your material is and what type of volatile it is, how well you keep your after cooler clean but if you think you're having a problem if you're seeing that oily film build up on your filters your hoses inside your filter housing it's only a matter of time before it gets to your desiccant um so i would say that's something to definitely look at um that video i showed earlier was definitely very eye-opening it's something i passed around con air here the other day when this came in from a uh, a customer so without a doubt i think that really is the proof is in the pudding that that stuff that sludge, that motor oil looking stuff is absolutely in your process and you need to take it out somehow. Um, we have some equipment to help you do that. Okay. Um, how does the drying process change for pure regrind material that has not been repelletized? Yes, yeah, so regrind is a different animal. Um, and one thing and probably the easiest thing that people forget is our drying hopper dictates the time that material spends in there. So if I have PET at 50 pounds per cubic foot and it holds a thousand pounds of material in my drying hopper, everything's cool. That's how I spec my system out. But now I decided I want to run 100% regrind PET and it's at 25 pounds a cubic foot. Well, my hopper no longer holds a thousand pounds then, right? Because that regrind is fluffier and has a lower bulk density. It actually holds half as much. It only holds 500 pounds an hour. So in theory, I've reduced my drying time by half which means I should reduce my throughput by half. But no one really does that, right? We continue to increase our regrind amounts, but we don't continue to increase our hopper sizes. So adding a little bit of regrind to your process isn't probably gonna matter, but the more regrind you add, the more you're gonna change the residence time in that system. Now, if it is something that's um, light and flaky, like a, like a PET bottle regrind, chunky granules I'm not as much worried about, but things like this, when you grind them up, they're like little kites or little little sails in your system. And what they do is they like to pack and they impede that airflow, just like a dirty filter would. So the way we get through that head of material or that extra pressure buildup is as we upsize the dryer one or two sizes on the blower, and that helps us get through that material a little bit better. So as you start to add in regrind, or if you think you're gonna use regrind, you may need to actually upsize the dryer to handle that. Lastly, there are some things we can do, but watch for funnel flow. We mentioned these dryers are mass flow, first in, first out. Well, sometimes because these flake regrinds like to kind of stick or, or mechanically link together like little Lincoln logs, right? Um, they can form these barriers or these bridges in the hopper, and then eventually it's path of least resistance. Instead of the whole mass going down as it's supposed to, you start to see a rat hole form. And then material starts to take the path least resistance through the center of the hopper or preferential down one side of the hopper. And now you're toast. You don't have any residence time. Your system's not working the way it's supposed to. And in a lot of cases, the only way to fix that is to drain the hopper. So 
really only a major issue with with materials like sheet film or PET flake stuff that's light and flaky like that. But ultimately, it will impact how your system system size and how your system works. So if you know you plan to run a lot of regrind, make sure you tell someone that when you're sizing your system. Thanks, Major. We did get some questions in that we didn't get to, but we'll make sure we answer those. We ran a little bit long here. I don't want to hold people over too long. So you, you can always email us your questions at info at conairgroup.com, and then we're happy to help you with any problems you have. And I certainly want to thank AJ and everyone in the audience for participating in this very informative event. The webinar was recorded and we will house it on our YouTube site so you can look for it there in the future. And we will have future educational webinars upcoming. Please make sure you're following us on our social media channels like LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Now the, the point that I think people have been maybe waiting for, the uh, Yeti cooler giveaway, at this time I'd like to announce the winner. So just before the webinar started, you can see AJ has on his screen there, we used a random number generator to select a winner. It was number 38, so I went into the registrant list. The 38 regist the 38th registrant was, drum roll, brrr, Carlos Ermel. So Carlos, you'll be hearing from me shortly. Congratulations and thank you to everyone who participated. There'll be uh, plenty more opportunities in the future to attend these webinars and, and win prizes like this. Thanks for joining us today in the presentation as part of the Con Air Education Series. AJ, great job and thank you for all your help. And everybody, I hope you have a great afternoon and a, 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 a successful holiday season upcoming. Stay safe, and uh, we'll see you again after the start of the year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, AJ. Yep. Thank you.